All right. Hi, everybody. This is a bit of an unusual way to do Grand Rounds, but it's the safest way right now. So I was invited to talk about a few topics of uh, the peripheral nerves. I'll get started because the topic is quite... um, the hour will be quite filled. I was asked uh, to talk about the these three topics of peripheral nerve disorders. I'll do my best to review these, um, but each in and of, of themselves could actually be in their own Grand Rounds lecture, so keep that in mind as we move through these topics. So the objectives um, are listed here, and the goal is to become familiar with these conditions and their diagnosis and potential treatment options. So first is Bell's palsy. It's a relatively common outpatient problem. The incidence ranges between 13 to 40 um, in 100,000, depending on the population and the study you look at. It appears that the sexes are equally affected the mean age of symptom onset is around 40. Some risk factors do exist. Specifically, um, this condition tends to be more common in pregnancy and in the immediate postpartum period, as well as in patients with diabetes. The diagnosis does tend to be pretty straightforward. It's characterized by an acute, meaning less than 72-hour, spontaneous onset of unilateral peripheral facial weakness without any other neurological signs or symptoms. One develops difficulty raising their eyebrows, closing their eyes, and moving the corner of their mouth on the affected side. Sometimes ear pain occurs or a high-pitched sound can be appreciated by the patient on the affected side. Loss of taste can be preceded by symptoms of weakness. And about a third to half of the cases are actually due to another etiology. And because they are not idiopathic, should not be called a Bell's palsy. Um, A little bit about the history of Bell's palsy. This is Sir Charles Bell. He was a surgeon and an anatomist, and although the description of Bell's palsy dates back to ancient art and text, in the early 1800s, he was the first to recognize that a peripheral facial palsy occurred as a result of the cranial nerve 7 having a dysfunction. He also described and coined Bell's phenomenon, which is the upward deviation of the eyeball during forced eyelid closure. And he described the long thoracic nerve, which innervates the serratus anterior muscle. The anatomy of the seventh cranial nerve is quite complex. It's formed by conjoining facial motor, uh, the facial motor root, which starts in the lower pons, the superior salivary nucleus, and fibers arising from the solitary nucleus in the medulla, forming and developing into the nervous intermedius. Together, these emerge from the brainstem at the cerebellopontine angle, entering into the internal auditory meatus, passing through the geniculate ganglion before they enter the facial canal. Within bony fa- within the bony facial canal, several branches arise and leave to give off um, fibers from the main facial nerve. This canal is very small, so there's little room for expansion as a result of inflammation. And here's a better Uh, less busy picture that shows that after the geniculate ganglion, parasympathetic fibers are first given off to the greater and lesser petrosal nerve. I don't know if you guys can see, you guys can't see me pointing. I apologize for that. Um, After that, a second uh, branch is a small motor branch that is given off and supplies the stapedius muscle in the inner ear. Uh, 
then the quarter timpani gives um, taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and parasympathetic fibers to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. It also receives fibers from the lingual nerve. The remainder of the facial nerve exits the skull at the stylohyoid foramen and travels toward the parotid gland. Three branches are given off before the muscles supplied in the face, and these are the nerve to the digastric, stylohyoid, and the posterior auricular branch. Finally, the five motor branches are given off to supply various facial muscles. And this is a nice depiction of that facial movement that the facial nerve is responsible for includes raising the eyebrows, wrinkling the forehead, closure of the eyes, wrinkling the nose, mouth closure, and wrinkling of the chin. It's of utmost importance to determine whether a facial weakness symptom is as a result of an upper versus a lower motor neuron lesion. One easy way to remember is that a peripheral or lower motor neuron lesion weakens the entire face, as you can see on the, on the right side here, where a central or upper motor neuron lesion causes only lower facial weakness. This is because the frontal and orbicularis oris muscles are bilaterally innervated, and the lesion in the right hemisphere, for example, would only cause left-sided lower facial weakness because the contralateral, uh, contralateral hemisphere or the hemisphere, um, the left hemisphere in this case, could still control the upper portion of the face. Some exceptions include brainstem lesions, typically the presence of neighboring pontine signs and involvement of other cranial nerve nuclei uh, is a clue that this is a brainstem lesion. Facial movement in laughing and crying can be seen with central lesions because of pathways mediating emotional stimulus, whereas with peripheral lesions, even if they have a genuine laugh or cry, their facial weakness would persist. When the presentation is classical, the patient can just be reassured and treated like we'll talk about in a few slides from here, but imaging should be considered in the following cases. If there are atypical physical signs, slow progression of weakness over the course of a few weeks, there is no improvement of weakness at four months, and um, there are abnormal facial movements such as twitching or spasm preceding the weakness, this could indicate that there is nerve irritation from mass effect. The initial imaging obtained should be at four months, and then if that's normal, repeating three months later, if there's still complete paralysis. And after that, if complete paralysis persists, a consideration should be made about getting a parotid gland biopsy. Imaging modalities to use include high-resolution CAT scans or MRIs with gadolinium. Enhancement of the seventh cranial nerve can be seen um, on MRI with an Bell's palsy, idiopathic cranial nerve 7 palsy, but lack of enhancement can actually suggest that they will have a good prognosis. If there's any evidence of enhancement in the inner ear or structures uh, surrounding that region, it can be suggestive of herpes zoster, even in the absence of vesicular eruption. These are some causes of unilateral facial weakness. HSV or herpes simplex virus activation is likely the cause of most cases, although there's no established method of confirming this in clinical practice. It's of utmost importance to inspect the palate and the auditory canal for vesicles on presentation and um, because these findings could indicate vesicular zoster or what we call Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. <laughs>
These are some causes of bilateral facial weakness. And um, most of these you guys might be familiar with, GBS, Guillain-Barre, um, Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome is a rare condition, primarily affecting females. It consists of recurrent episodes of facial paralysis, episodic facial swelling, and a fissured tongue. Granulomatous inflammation is seen in the edematous tissue, and the cause is not known. And unfortunately, there has been no proven treatment for this condition. The American Academy of Neurology does have clinical guidelines published for the treatment of Bell's palsy. There appears to be strong evidence for the use of steroids that help hasten the recovery and improve facial strength. Steroids should be used with caution in diabetics, patients with osteopenia, steroid intolerance, obesity. Evidence for the use of antivirals is still considered weak, but going back to the thought that most Bell's palsy is felt to be due to reactivation of the herpes virus, it is widely used, and there's a strong susp suspicion that it is efficacious in combination with steroids, especially with more severe cases of facial weakness. And for the most part, antivirals tend to be well tolerated. This trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and looked at the use of prednisone and acyclovir for Bell's palsy. The graph shows rates of full recovery at nine months for patients with Bell's palsy who were treated with prednisolone and placebo, prednisolone and acyclovir, placebo and placebo, and acyclovir and placebo. In those patients who received placebo two-thirds recovered completely by three months, and 85% recovered completely by nine months. The use of prednisolone significantly increased the rate of complete recovery um, to 83% and 94.4% at three and nine months, respectively. Acyclovir either alone or in combination with prednisolone didn't appear to show any additional benefit. This is a representation of the percent of patients with Bell's palsy making a complete recovery by time and treatment groups. Patients who received prednisolone and placebo had a significantly faster rate of recovery, uh, meaning complete facial function at 75 days compared to those receiving placebo and placebo who experienced complete facial recovery at 104 days or patients with valcyclovir placebo combination who had complete recovery at 135 days. Similarly, a significantly higher rate of recovery was seen at 3, 6, and 12 months in patients who received prednisolone, and no significant additional improvement um, was found when prednisolone was combined with valcyclovir. These are the recommended treatment protocols, and ideally, treatment should begin within three months of symptom, I'm sorry, three days of symptom onset. Treatment also involves eye care, specifically to prevent drying and abrasion of the cornea, which can be very painful, and these are some options for patients. The prognosis tends to be good, especially if the lesion is incomplete. Patients do tend to recover. If improvement occurs at within the first 21 days, weakness tends to recover pretty well. This grading system is generally accepted as an objective and clinical measure of severity of the weakness that patients experience. It is also helpful to keep objective record of recovery, the House Brockman grading scale. Severity ranges from normal facial function to slight mouth asymmetry and all the way down to total paralysis where they are unable to wrinkle their forehead, close their eye, or have any mouth movement. Aberrant re occurs if an axon 
that was previously innervating a specific muscle grows down to a different um, fascicle and ends up innervating different muscles. Typically, this is seen with severe axonal loss as the nerve regenerates. So, for example, what happens is that smiling can cause eye uh, ca can cause the eye to close, or closing the eye can cause the lips to move. Lacrimation, salivation, or hemifacial sweating can occur when a particular other muscle is activated. So I have a little video of this. This is a 55-year-old woman who developed a moderate right facial palsy 20 years earlier as a con consequence of a removal of a large acoustic neuroma that gradually improved. Uh, and here, when she blinks, she has co-contraction of the right orbicularis oris. And when she smiles, she has co-contraction of um, the right orbicularis oris as well, causing the... Uh, palpebral fissure to narrow, and these are signs of aberrant regeneration of the facial nerve with synkinesia. So let's play that. A couple more times. Good. Now, if you'll let me see your teeth. Okay, good. Again. Good. Again. Good. Okay. Good. A couple more times. We'll play it again. Good. Now, if you'll let me see your teeth. Okay. Good. Again. Good. Again. Good. Okay, the blink reflex is helpful in evaluating the arc of the, the blink reflex, which gives us information about the trigeminal nerve as well as the facial nerve. And it can help uh, and it can be used to tell if there's been aberrant innervation in chronic lesions. Um, the blink reflex and EMG and nerve conduction studies of the face help answer these important questions. The EMG and nerve conduction studies are helpful in evaluating the individual motor branches of the facial nerve. And one thing, one important thing to remember is that testing has to occur at least six days after a facial weakness develops to al allow for enough time for Wallerian degeneration to have occurred in these motor fibers. And I would actually recommend at least two weeks because for the most part, the treatment course is rarely altered by um, the timing of blink reflex and electrodiagnostic testing of the facial nerve. And finally, individuals who have incomplete recovery um, do have some options and methods that can be employed to help the patient. Oftentimes, management requires an interdisciplinary approach. Um, psychological support is big because it's been shown over and over again that these individuals do suffer from, um, usually depression can be accompanying their symptoms because of the facial asymmetry and um, the symptoms that they experience. So next we'll talk about post-herpetic neuralgia. And typically post-herpetic neuralgia is self-limited pain from acute herpes zoster. Although in some individuals, the pain does persist for a long time after the resolution of the rash, and it can often be difficult to treat, unfortunately. After a history of varicella zoster, the virus can be dormant in the dorsal root ganglia of cranial nerves or spinal nerves for years. As immunity wanes with age and patients become immunocompromised, reactivation can occur. Uh, so acute neuritis occurs when the virus travels down along the peripheral nerve. 
at the cellular level, hemorrhagic inflammation is described of not only the peripheral nerve, but also the dorsal root and the dorsal root ganglion. Sometimes the virus can extend centrally into the spinal cord and the leptomeninges. And although attempts have been made to understand this better, there is no clear reason why some individuals have persistent pain and others do not. In a questionnaire of 385 adults aged 65 and older, it was found that they had persistence in post-herpetic neuralgia symptoms with a mean duration of 3.3 years. And I thought this was a fun cartoon depiction of an unfortunately not so pleasant disease process, but kind of talks about varicella and zoster many years later. There are various phases of pain with herpes zoster. Initially, there is acute herpetic neuralgia. This can precede or accompany the rash. Then subacute herpetic neuralgia occurs when there's um, persistence of symptoms beyond the healing of the rash, but typically this resolves within four months of symptom onset. And when symptoms of pain persist uh, past four months from the initial onset of the rash, it is considered post-herpetic neuralgia. Risk factors that um, can increase this type of pain is age, um, acute pain being more severe, and a more severe rash. The diagnosis, again, tends to be pretty straightforward. Patients have persistent neuropathic pain described as um, sharp, burning, stabbing, constant, uh, with loss of sensation or allodynia, which is pain response to a non-painful stimulus. Um, they have this neuropathic pain in the region of their rash where the vesicles have erupted. And the most commonly affected levels tend to be the thoracic, cervical, and trigeminal region. Uh, in the thoracic spine, especially T4 through T6, Rarely, if a, if a patient does not recall pain being associated with a rash, the diagnosis can be a bit more difficult. And in this case, if there is a high enough index of suspicion, CSF would reveal that there is a VZV in the spinal fluid. These are typically the first-line treatment options for post-herpetic neuralgia. Other in considerations include these, and some of which have some pitfalls. For example, capsaicin can be difficult to apply in terms of frequency. It can be painful. Um, opioids can have drawbacks in and of themselves. And... Um, Intrathecal glucocorticoid injections don't work very well for trigeminal nerve distribution. Um, herpes zoster. Gabapentin has been looked at in multiple studies and does appear to have significant benefit. Um, so this is one uh, study in JAMA in 2018 that did show that patients had pretty good improvement in their pain compared to placebo. Pregabalin or Lyrica has also been looked at and studied and they appear to have good benefit for individuals in the treatment of post-herpetic neuralgia. Of course, both of these can sometimes be limited with side effects, especially in the older population or those with renal impairment, limiting the dose that we can use. Tricyclic antidepressants have been known to 
benefit individuals with this type of pain dating back all the way to the 80s and other subsequent trials have confirmed that as well. And again, some side effects to keep an eye out on. Nortriptyline does tend to be tolerated a bit better. I'm sorry, I, here we go. And a few other options are available here, anticonvulsants. And going back to what we talked about, topical capsaicin has some benefit, but oftentimes it's difficult to manage application so many times a day and tolerating the burning, stinging redness that um, comes along with it. It's also difficult to uh, blind this treatment when they're looking at it in studies. Opioids are controversial. They do seem to be effective, but there is the concern about physical dependence, tolerance, addiction, overdose. It's felt that perhaps the older population having a higher incidence of postherpetic neuralgia has a lower risk for potential abuse. So it's, it's something to think about. And... Finally, um, Botox does appear to be effective and well-tolerated in some of these trials that it was looked at. Um, I, I'm not aware of anybody doing that here. I'm not sure if um, I just haven't heard about it, but I do know of one um, physiatrist up at the University of Minnesota who also published some things and is looking at pain treatment for post-mastectomy scars in women who are breast cancer survivors and Botox in that region seems to help um, some persistent pain that they may have. Ultimately, prevention is the key for post-herpetic neuralgia um, with vaccinating for our, our children now for varicella and older individuals for zoster. Antiviral therapy in cases of zoster should help hasten the healing of the skin lesions, prevent new lesions, decrease viral shedding, reduce the risk of transmission, lessen the severity and duration of pain, and prevent subsequent post-herpetic neuralgia as well. Okay, so we'll move to the last topic which is peripheral neuropathy. And um, as I often describe this to my patients, it's a disease of and dysfunction of the longest nerves in the body, usually. Typically, the nerves in the hands and feet tend to be affected. Incidence rises with age. One population study estimated that the prevalence is up to 30% of individuals over the age of 80, although it's difficult to determine because sometimes if it's just numbness and loss of sensation, it is underreported and some patients are not even aware of their symptoms. Variable terminology and lack of diagnostic criteria can add to the uncertainty of the true incidence and prevalence of peripheral neuropathy. The goal of working up somebody with these symptoms is to find a potentially treatable cause. About 50, uh, 20 to 50 and sometimes even 60% are found to be idiopathic depending on the intensity of the workup. And this um, diagnosis should include at least two of the following. It's a bit of an oversimplification because not all neuropathies are distal or symmetric, um, and there are very many different types of etiologies that we are aware of at this point. Reasons to pursue the diagnosis. Uh, patients do appreciate diagnostic closure, understanding why they have the symptoms that they have education regarding the natural history of neuropathy and potential research participation. Even if we find that our patient has idiopathic peripheral neuropathy, they can be reassured that progression to non-ambulation or amputation is very uncommon in the idiopathic neuropathy population. <clears throat> 
These are the various types of neuropathies, kind of big groups that it can be separated into. Electrodiagnostic testing is um, important, again, in diagnosing peripheral neuropathies. Basically, this is kind of an oversimplification of what we do with nerve conduction testing. Um, we test motor and sensory nerves. We measure um, the distance between um, how nerves are stimulated and where they are recorded to obtain the conduction velocity. Standard values are used to interpret the pattern of the lesion and locations of the lesions when the compound muscle action potentials or the sensory nerve action potential amplitude is reduced. It is suggestive of an axonal loss. And when conduction velocity is slow to a certain degree, this is considered a demyelinating lesion. Electromyography involves evaluation of muscles with the needle. It doesn't have too uh, much um, value in peripheral neuropathies, although there are some situations where we get a little bit more information, not doesn't change the diagnosis very much. This represents where the electrodes are placed when the nerve is stimulated. This is a simple nerve conduction study of the median motor nerve. Demyelinating neuropathies impair nerve conduction by allowing current leakage through exposed axons. Um, action potential propagation is slowed dramatically, and some of these demyelinating lesions um, can be treated. There are far fewer demyelinating neuropathies than there are axonal ones. Um, Charcot-Marie tooth is the most common hereditary neuropathy, and the majority of them are demyelinating, um, types 1, 3, and 4, and there are many more subtypes with uh, letters in that group. There are different um, acronyms that I have up here, so if anybody has questions about those. Nodopathies are thought to be conduction block produced by an impaired ion channel function. The best example is something called AMAN, or acute motor axonal neuropathy. This is a variant of Guillain-Barre, and these individuals have rapid and severe loss of compound muscle, muscle action potential, suggesting axonal loss but their relatively quick resolution of the changes on nerve conduction studies isn't compatible with what's expected with this type of mechanism of injury. So it's believed that it isn't the actual axon that's destroyed, it's that the signal and ion function is impaired, giving that picture of an axonal disease when really it isn't that the axon becomes destroyed. Neuronopathies are neuropathies that originate in motor or sensory cell bodies. Um, some of the Charcot-Marie tooth um, hereditary neuropathies are neuronopathies. Toxins um, can lead to neuronopathies. A hereditary motor neuropathy and hereditary spastic paraparesis, these two tend to be predominantly uh, motor and length dependent. Benign focal amyotrophy or monomelic amyotrophy tends to affect only one limb. This is a Parsonage Turner type of picture. ALS and uh, progressive muscular atrophy, these are also considered neuropathies in a sense, but they are neuronopathies of the motor neurons. They tend to affect one limb and progress and generalize with time. And um, multifocal motor neuropathy, or MMN, I'm sorry about that, um, is, uh, like the title says, multifocal. And this is a treatable 
motor neuronopathy that can sometimes mimic ALS. So this is always something to keep in, in the back of our minds when we are considering an ALS diagnosis because it's far more exciting to give somebody a multifocal motor neuron diagnosis, which is treatable. Sensory neuronopathies, um, they, they, these are also rare, but some of the things to consider is that inflammatory and immune-mediated processes can cause these um, toxic things like B6 toxicity, infectious diseases, and there are some hereditary and degenerative causes of sensory neuronopathies. Um, I did see one case in fellowship that was a woman who had a severe sensory neuronopathy, and basically they present with loss of sensation and significant ataxia because they're unable to feel where their feet are at all. And um, this woman actually ended up being diagnosed with celiac disease. Small fiber neuropathy is as a result of impairment of the pain and temperature fibers. By definition, these individuals have normal large fiber sensation, vibration, and proprioception. They have normal strength and normal routine nerve conduction studies. So oftentimes I'll see an individual who has um, loss of sensation in their feet. Their exam reveals decreased pinprick. Everything else on the exam is normal. And when we do the nerve conductions, it's their values are completely normal. And in that case, an intraepidermal nerve fiber density with a skin biopsy can be very helpful because it tells us about the density of those fibers. And if they are reduced, it can be diagnostic of a small fiber neuropathy. They also have abnormal thermal responses to quantitative sensory testing. This is not something we have um, available here but the autonomic lab at Mayo does do this. Non-length dependent neuropathies, also known as mononeuritis multiplex or multifocal neuropathies, these are very important because there are a few and um, this really reduces the number of things to consider in your differential diagnosis. So HMPP is uh, hereditary neuropathy with pressure palsies. These are uh, an, an inherited cause. It isn't treatable. But systemic vasculitic uh, neuropathy or non-systemic vasculitic neuropathy, cryoglobulinemia, um, and th these are potentially treatable. Other causes of neuropathies to consider are nutritional deficiencies, um, vitamin B12, thiamine deficiency, copper deficiency. Um, toxins can be the culprit here as well. Um, although industrial agents are better regulated in this country, it's important to get a good history from the patient to make sure that they aren't having exposure in their private lives from hobbies and things like that. This is a overview of some of the medications that can potentially cause um, neuropathy. And that's helpful when you're trying to narrow down the etiology for a patient. It's also important in CMT patients or Charcot-Marie tooth patients because um, they and other patients with hereditary neuropathies, if exposed to some of these agents, can actually have a more rapid progression of their disease process and because their nerves are more susceptible to toxic effects. The Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation has good information about which medications to avoid for these patients, so that's something I try to educate them on. This is a nice breakdown of the causes of neuropathy. By and far, diabetes is the most common cause, diabetes, prediabetes. It's not unheard of, though, for a diabetic patient to have an additional cause. So care must be taken not to miss the potentially reversible or treatable causes that, of neuropathy, even in diabetics. So 
ultimately, though, strict blood glucose control will prevent um, more rapid progression for diabetics. The typical laboratory workup for somebody presenting with a, a length-dependent symmetric sensory motor neuropathy involves checking for vitamin B12 and MMA with or without homocysteine levels, um, making sure that they don't have any elevation of glucose to suggest diabetes, and serum immunofixation and electrophoresis, especially as they get older. Older individuals are a little bit more at risk for paraproteinemias causing neuropathy. A more intense workup is indicated if patient has acute to subacute onset of peripheral neuropathy. They have rather rapid progression, motor predominance, non-length dependent sensory findings, or association with systemic disease or symptoms of dysautonomia, such as um, gastroparesis, um, lack of sweating, increased sweating, dry skin, um, lightheadedness, dizziness, syncope, orthostatic symptoms, things like that. Uh, the role of antibody testing remains unclear. Incidental findings and false positives are common, and autoantibody panels should be avoided for that reason, but there are some clinically relevant patterns where antibody testing can be helpful and can help target, like I said before, multifocal motor neuropathy, MMN. Um, this is something that's made by electrodiagnostic, uh, a diagnosis that's made by electrodiagnostic findings, but anti-GM1 antibody is certainly helpful, and this can help with initiating treatment for these patients. Finally, genetic testing, although recommended by multiple neuromuscular societies, there are some limitations. First, it's cost prohibitive. Most insurances don't cover this. There is limited access to genetic counselors, and sometimes variants of undetermined significance can confuse us and the patient more. Uh, there are over 80 recognized hereditary neuropathy genotypes, autosomal dominant, recessive, X-linked. Um, but there are great benefits to genetic testing, which include, again, diagnostic closure, psychological and cost benefits, optimal genetic counseling for the patient and their families, monitoring and treatment of end organ involvement, and uh, Specifically, like we talked about before, avoidance of some of these neurotoxic drugs. In rare cases, um, and again, this is more research related, but there are some therapeutic interventions like in hereditary amyloidosis. There is a medication on the market for that right now. Other testing includes nerve and skin biopsies. Um, a nerve biopsy is typically last resort and should be limited to a very specific population, uh, vasculitic neuropathy or um, non-inherited systemic amyloidosis. It is the last resort because it can be very invasive. It's costly. There's low yield because some of these neuropathies can be patchy in nature and you have to sacrifice sensory nerve function in that region for the patient to get... Uh, piece of the nerve. A skin biopsy is typically used to evaluate that intraepidermal nerve fiber density in small fiber neuropathy like we talked about. And finally, just a brief slide on uh, treatment. There are few treatable neuropathies and they include immunomodulating therapy. Um, the rest are really targeted at managing the symptoms of neuropathy. Nutritional deficiencies can sometimes easily be treated. And finally, um, avoidance of further nerve toxicity is the goal. The closing points are to remember the red flags with Bell's palsy presentation that require further workup, such as imaging. Um, in terms of post-herpetic neuralgia, there are various treatment options. Finding a treatment that's effective and well-tolerated by the patient can sometimes be difficult, requires patients from both the patient and the physician because side effects can um, be limiting. And finally, although 
diabetic length-dependent neuropathy is by far the most common cause of neuropathy, looking for historical and physical exam clues that would suggest other causes of neuropathy, particularly something that's potentially treatable or reversible, is important when we evaluate patients with neuropathy. Okay. That's it for me. Any uh, questions? see anything right now. Thank you for being patient while I zipped through these very big topics. Um, but I think it was, it's good to have a little bit of overview of what we look for. Thank you for inviting me to speak. <laughs>